a, an entire continent or island worth of, of, of data without just crippling compliance. Now, I mean, certainly compliance have some optimization to go, but there's a lot of data in those worlds, gigabytes of data. So they use what's called a clip map. Um, now, what is a clip map? A clip map is a structure that says, where I'm standing, I'm, I want to include all of the really high detail information. So you see in this drawing, the red dot is where you would be standing. And all those little, little squares around it represent what, what, are called, what we call cells. And each cell, it's about 40 by 40 by 40 boxes. Uh, contains all the information uh, close around you. Now, if you go a little further away, and all of a sudden those cells double in each dimension, they still contain the same number of voxels, which means they still contain the same amount of detail as one of those cells. Well. That's what you're, you see when um, something goes a little bit into the distance and it starts to lower in quality. It's because of the, the fact that it is. It's, it's, it's called level detail system. So the amount of detail is getting lower as you get further out. Uh, the goal is to keep the number of triangles about the same, uh, no, matter what, no matter how much screen that those things are occupying. So, but the real advantage of this is that each player has a very small fraction of the data that they need uh, for the entire island at any one time. So we don't have to send the entire continent down to you. We can actually just stream that to you as you move through the world. So there's a couple of different types of level of detail in the game. The first type is what you're, you're seeing when you see these beautiful far off vistas with mountains and trees and the trees are props. Um, the procedural terrain. That is actually calculated based on a mathematical function with a lot of input to it. But we can actually recalculate that mathematical function at, at a lower resolution to get the exact points where, that, where those boxes should be in the distance. Um, that's the easier of the two um, and, and it has more accurate results. The other kind is from user modified boxes. And the level of detail for those is much more complicated. You don't have any procedural math we can go back to, to to regenerate that information. So we actually have to uh, <coughs> take the user modified voxels and approximate what they would look like at that lower detail level. And the next slide kind of shows that, what, what can happen. Mm -hmm. So on the left, you, you have a, a voxel grid at a certain say this is your highest resolution, let's say this is the resolution of what you see right around you, and you have a shape that you're representing. Well, let's say, you know, eight to 20, 10 cells out, you now need to display that same shape, but at a lower resolution. So the system has to make a guess about, or not a guess, but an approximation of what the original shape was, but with much, few, much uh, less information. So this is why you see that degradation at distance. Um, so we have a couple of uh, things that we are researching to try and uh, resolve that problem. We, we have some very promising early results. Uh, actually, I'm going to show this uh, video here first. So this is this is a, a special debugging view that we have in our client um, that shows the yeah, range of uh, level of detail. So, for example, in, in the image you're seeing, the red represents the stuff that's right around you, the highest resolution. The blue is the first ring of level of detail, the yellow, and the green, and the pink. So each, each one of those rings is actually showing that what you have done in a, uh, in a, in a lower resolution. So I think it's kind of a cool way of doing it. Um, all right. So one of the, thing, one of the plans that we have uh, to enhance this is to improve the accuracy of those level of detail cells by using the same Roman vectors that we saw in the previous slides. So um, that's something that we've always been working on and we hope to see some, some, some real fruit bearing from that soon. Um, the other way we, we've talked about doing it is to actually use more traditional uh, mesh simplification technologies that take the highest resolution mesh that gets generated from those voxels and then start to remove points from the mesh such that it doesn't disturb the shape of the mesh. Um, it's probably really in some combination of those two approaches to get, get you guys the best, the best visuals at a distance. And one thing that um, Jeff mentioned in his building panel, if you guys were there, is that uh, we can also add a, a publishing step to improve this as well. Because if you, a lot of the reason why this stuff uh, looks the way it does is because we have to do it so fast, because everything is done on the fly. Um, you know, we don't want your clients sitting there churning away at a level for six hours to 
make the, the meshes look better. So what we can do though, eventually is we've got a polish step, we can take that, the polish can take as much time as it needs to make it look good, and then everybody else will, get, will see it in a much better level of detail. So, um, next topic I have is more generally about our graphics engine. Now, this is the Forge Lite engine that we got. Um, a lot of our games at SME use this engine. It is an engine that uses, uh, it's called deferred rendering. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit about what deferred rendering is. It takes too long, it's a few months in my presentation. <laughs> um, so deferred rendering. Deferred rendering refers to how lighting works. Um, forward renders, the, the field is split kind of 50 50 between forward renders and deferred renders in the industry. Like all the Unreal games are forward renders for the most part, and but there's a lot of other games that use deferred rendering as well. Uh, in forward rendering, all of the lighting is done in one pass. Uh, but that includes uh, all the expensive lighting calculations for every <coughs> single pixel on every single object in the scene. And that can just really get slow when you have a lot of dynamic moving lights. What a deferred renderer does is it defers the, the lighting uh, calculations to a second pass, collecting all that information uh, in preparation for that lighting uh, pass in what, we, what they call G-buffers. Different engines have different types of G-buffers, but here's kind of some of the ones that we use. Uh, and then the, the advantage is that uh, only the pixels that you see in the scene have to have the lighting calculations done on them all at one time. So you can have a lot more dynamic lights. So that was why it was chosen for a planet side. Very good for us because we have a lot of dynamic content. We figured eventually we'll have a lot of moving lights in the game. So as you can see, when you combine all these G buffers together and put the light again, you get the final result. Alright, so how do, this, how do lights and shadows work? Well, we have three different kinds of lights in, in the game. We have the sun and moonlight, which is a, uh, a global directional light that's always around. Uh, they cast shadows. Uh, we have point or omnidirectional lights. Those are the ones that, you, that you guys have had since uh, mid alpha where that you can place in your clans. Uh, they do not cast shadows, but they illuminate light all around them. And then the engine also supports spotlights. Uh, you just recently got spotlights on the marketplace. Um, and the yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, these are, have sh shadows optional. Um, right now, the, the shadows are not enabled on those. We may do so in the future. We're just trying to balance performance because these, these spotlights that cast shadows can be pretty uh, costly in terms of how slow they are to render. Um, but we're still evaluating, evaluating that. Um, so a little bit more about shadows. Shadows are rendered from the perspective of each light source to cast them. So they can be quite, they can take quite a while to render. In fact, the, the worst times are uh, during dawn and dusk when you have extremely long shadows, like in this screenshot here. Um, in fact, some games even go to the extent of avoiding, of turning off shadows during their dawn and dusk periods so that it doesn't slow down their frame rate. Um, but we think they look too, too cool to turn them off, and we love them. So I, I think you guys probably all do as well. Uh, now, spotlights with shadows, you can actually, what you can actually do is you can constrain the range of them so that you can um, reduce the load on your, on your processor and on your graphics card. Uh, the trick is, is you don't want to have a bunch of them in the same spot. And we'll get to that in the, in the coming slides here. So, let's talk about some of the lights you have now. So, the mm -hmm. scene that you have to see here, and uh, I don't know if the person who built this scene is here or not, but it was, it was a really good person to see for how, how, how do you light. Uh, there are many point lights in the scene, and you'll see a little toolbar on the right there. That's because uh, this is taken out of the NVIDIA tool called Insight, which is used to debug graphics systems, and we use that pretty heavily. Um, so the red sphere here represents a good, suitable light. It's, it's got a decent radius, it's illuminating a lot of, of uh, solid triangles, very useful effect. So this second red sphere represents less efficient light because it's got a really big radius, there's a lot of the sphere is not lighting anything, um, it's kind of inefficient. And then obviously this can get really bad if you have a lot of overlapping lights. <laughs> As you can see here, uh, this is extremely inefficient, it's not lighting anything, hardly anything except for the very, very top of the temple. Um, and what ends up happening is you're, you're drawing those pixels over and over and over again, 
and basically getting rid of all the advantage that you had from being a deferred renderer in the first place and sort of slowing down back to what it was like if you were in a forward rendering system. So just something to, to note as builders. Um, eventually we want to have meters or tools or <coughs> some sort of scoring system in place so that um, the game itself can tell you, hey, you know, you've built something, it may look really cool, but it's killing everybody's frame rate. So here's what you can do to, to make it faster. <laughs> My uh, LOG submission. So let's talk about oceans. Shouldn't it be like, uh, you guys like the oceans, like right? Ocean. All right, yeah, we love, really, some really talented people put that together. Sure. Very, very cool looking. So one of the interesting bits about our oceans is that the uh, all of the wave animation is all computed on the graphics card. The CPU has no knowledge of it whatsoever. Um, and it's kind of built on top of the boxes. The boxes aren't actually moving. It's just all built in your graphics card. We'll, uh, we'll skip this because I'm running for the time here. But you've all seen it. Um, so let's talk about how the wave technology works at a, at a high level. So how do you animate waves? Well, you start with what's called a noise map. It's a basically just a texture that has some noise in it. Um, and then you need to apply it to the heights of the waves and animate them over time. A lot of games early on, they used a very simple um, Animation we use like overlapping sine waves. Kind of leads to kind of an unrealistic, choppy look as you can see here. You see, you remember all the games that look like that. It was pretty bad. Um, but eventually, Hollywood found a way. I think the first movie they did it with Titanic, uh, of using actual wave spectrum that were collected from from actual wave data from the ocean and applying those to your wave animations. And that, that's what we've done here. There's a lot of uh, wave spectrum available. Oh. We do send Darren McPherson out to the bay near La Jolla with a buoy and an antenna <laughs> to gather this data for us. So the waves that are in Landmark now are provided by Darren. You should thank him. Alright, so, so once we have the up-down wave height animation, then we need to add some side-to-side -side animation with what we call kind of our wave choppiness. And here's a couple of screenshots that sort of show the different steps of that. Um, so how do we light the ocean? How do we make it sparkle? Well, as you can see here, the difference between a, an unlit scene and a lit scene is pretty dramatic. Um, so we start with, with no water, because we need to be able to see through to the bottom, right? The water is translucent, it isn't opaque. So, uh, then we move on to adding the, the water layer trans with some transparency and some refraction effects, which as you can see in the little highlighted section there, it actually offsets the underwater pixels a little bit to make it look as if the light is reflect refracting through the surface of the water. Then we compute the surface direction, and that's what this uh, picture represents. Each of those colors represents a different dire uh, direction towards the camera. Use the surface directions to add highlights to the waves. And then you combine that with cloud, fog, and other post effects um, to get the final image that you see here. So, swimming and diving. We had a lot of fun with this stuff. So, bobbing physics sounds odd, but anyway, bobbing physics. Um, moving up and down on the surface of the water um, is all done by reading that information back from the graphics card. As I said earlier, the, 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 your central... I'm sorry, can you try to redo that slide? It appears to not be playing the video. Or it's playing underneath the screen, because I see like one button. There we go. Hmm. Go back one slide. There we go. Well, that's diving. Oh! <laughs> yeah, so we did say that you're mortal now. Uh, you want to dive a little bit farther out. Uh, Good job. Really <laughs> 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 so anyway, one of the cool parts about it is that, you know, since, since all that information is only living on your graphics card, we have to read it, actually read it back from the graphics card to be able to tell where on the wave you are so we can put the character there. Uh, to be able to figure out whether or not you're actually should be swimming at the moment. We actually read the voxel data, so we walk through and say, well, how many how many water voxels is, are overlapping my body uh, to figure out when and where we should turn the swimming on and off, to, you know, where we should apply you know, splashing effects and things like that. And then for the actual diving component, how many people have actually used diving? 
Oh, not too many. Well, you know, if you jump out over water and hold the shift button down, you do this spectacular dive, which thing we saw there. So give it a try. Um, we actually use NVIDIA's physics system to do what's called a ray cast, where as you're flying, as you're falling down, it looks down below you and says, is there water? Is there water? Is there water? And if it finds enough water, it puts you into diving animation. It's all pretty cool stuff. All right, so now some interesting parts of the panel. Uh, I don't think the rest of the I don't think they want to see this stuff. Okay. Uh, so, yeah.